Portland City Council. Keelan, good morning. Please call the roll. Good morning. Rubio. Here. Ryan. Here. Gonzalez. Here. Caps. Here. Here. Now we'll hear from our city attorney on the rules of order and decorum. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to Portland City Council. Sure, to testify okay, before right. council in person or virtually, you must sign up in advance on the council agenda at www.portland.gov slash council slash agenda. Information on engaging with city council can be found on the council clerk's webpage. The presiding officer preserves order and decorum during city council meetings. The presiding officer determines the length of testimony. Individuals generally have three minutes to testify unless otherwise stated. A timer will indicate when your time is done. Disruptive conduct such as shouting, refusing to conclude your testimony when your time is up, or interrupting others' testimony or council deliberations will not be allowed. If you cause a disruption, a warning will be given. Further disruption will result in ejection, in ejection from the meeting. Anyone who fails to leave once ejected is subject to arrest for trespass. Additionally, council may take a short recess and reconvene virtually. Your testimony should address the matter being considered. When testifying, please state your name for the record, but your address is not necessary. Disclose if you are a lobbyist and if you are representing an organization, please identify it. For testifiers who are joining virtually, please unmute yourself once the council clerk calls your name. Thank you. Thank you. First up is communications item 180. Request of Jack Coleman to address council regarding bicycle and pedestrian infrastructure. Jack, welcome. Thank you. Thanks for being here. Appreciate it. Yeah, my name is Jack Coleman. I'm a Portland resident having moved out here three years ago and uh, to move closer to my adult sons, uh, grown to love Portland. Great. And uh, today I want to speak about safety for bicyclists. Okay. Right. Well, uh, almost without exception, bike riders are passionate about cycling, and I am one of them. We love to bike. It's a great sense of joy. Bicycling is very often about renewal. People who take it up are doing it to get healthy, both physically and mentally. Uh, it's also a very practical mode of transportation. Regarding that love and passion, the same cannot be said of motorists. Uh, and I'm one of them also. Um, we are not passionate about driving, particularly in an urban setting. It's a means to an end, an expensive inconvenience. We feel uh, entitled to obstacle-free travel, which often leads to aggressive actions and reactions toward cyclists. Uh, cell phones and other distractions make motorists uh, even more dangerous. So whether it's an argument, near miss, collision, injury, or even death, uh, the motorist can dismiss this uh, with a justification that the cyclist got in my way or they don't belong on my road. Um, but for the cyclist who is hit by a motorist, the trauma, both physical and psychological, are, uh, and as well as recovery, can be significant. Their sense of joy for bicycling is often irreparably damaged, and if the bicyclist is killed, the loss to all people connected to that person is beyond words. Uh, in 2018, my son, when we were still living in Pennsylvania, uh, we were leading a group bicycle ride. Uh, he was supporting a new rider at the back of the ride who had gotten dropped off the back. Uh, the ride finished. My son did not return. I got a call saying he had been hit by a vehicle, and I didn't know whether he was dead or alive. So I drove up to the site where it was, the ambulances, the police stepped into the ambulance. They were cutting off his clothes. They had a neck brace on. They were checking for vitals. The driver had stopped. The cops were questioning him. Uh, he hit my son at 70 miles an hour. Uh, statistically, he should have been dead. He lived, um, but not obviously without uh, ramifications. He had to have his shoulder reconstructed, concussion, rotator cuff, all kinds of things. Could have been a lot worse. Um, He's here today in, in Portland, uh, still riding his bike, uh, suffering from PTSD. He'll be out on the road, and the hair on his back of his neck stands up when he, when he, uh, when he is riding. And he's in the bike industry. Uh, uh, so I told you that. Um, bicycles are people. Bicyclists are people, not obstacles. Uh, Portland residents being seriously injured and killed regularly on our streets. I just want to say, please, you can do more. I say this to the council, you can do more to keep them safe, uh, to keep us all safe. Thank you. Thank you, we appreciate your being here. For sure, Ed, Mr. Mass. Jack, before you go, number one, thank you so much for coming in um, and testifying today and sharing your story. Um, 
you know, uh, like you um, and I think everyone on this council, um, we believe that improving the um, safety of our transportation infrastructure is a top priority and we continue to work on that every day. Um, I also believe that your call for um, uh, more mindful behavior, especially when you're behind the wheel of a car, is um, incredibly appropriate. I will tell you, more than half of our fatal traffic cat crashes in Portland involve a one or both parties were under the influence of drugs or alcohol. Mm -hmm. um, and these are choices that also people can make better choices. And that's a message that also gets out, uh, needs to get out uh, um, today too. Um, so I appreciate you both calling for better infrastructure, calling for uh, more mindful behavior. Um, I'm glad to see that uh, in the last year where we've seen bike ridership um, increase by 5%, so we're moving in the right direction. I would, may I comment on that? Yeah, sure. I don't think that's any kind of a solution to increase ridership when the safety of the riders who exist uh, isn't fully um, dealt with, right? Uh, well, I, I hope that we can do both. Uh, um, I'll tell you. And I agree. You yeah, want to see it increase. Yeah, you do. definitely. We want, we want to see it increase. Uh, definitely. Uh, as the transportation commissioner, one of the things I'm trying to do is build a multimodal transportation system right. so you can get to where you want to go, uh, how you need, how you want to get there. Mm -hmm. um, as we do all of that, we need to make our system safer too. Um, and we hear you loud and clear. And I'm glad to see that your son is, or hear that your son is. Uh, Doing well and back on his bike. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah, man, one more thing. One of the challenges is you, you, keep, you know, as uh, riders increase, often they're inexperienced. They're new to the area. They're not in, uh, experienced in urban riding, and so you end up with more danger, not less, right? And you're having to keep track of people who are just inexperienced and not understanding. Well, I hear you, and I feel that too. I'll tell you, I have two um, teenage boys, what, 15 and 13, and they commute home from school every day on their bikes. Um, they have been riding their bikes for as long as you can, right, from the very beginning. But they're still young, and um, we have, um, they've had some close calls. Yeah, I know yeah. uh, we all have skin in this game. Yeah, I uh, But I appreciate your advocacy and your perspective, and I hear you, um, and I think we're on the same page. Yeah. And I am loosely uh, affiliated with Bike Cloud. I mean, part of Pedal Palooza and so forth, got involved in leading rides and so forth since I got out here. So that's kind of my connection. Great. Thanks for your Thank service. You. Don't thanks go just yet. Commissioner Ryan. Oh. I just have a quick question. First of all, thanks for being here. My pleasure. Your courage, and especially when something like that happens to your son. Yeah. Uh, I missed the detail on where the driver was going 70 miles an hour. Where was the actual incident? Uh, this was outside of Scranton, Pennsylvania, kind of a, a road leading into the city. Oh. And we would do uh, we would do road rides, weekly road rides, out into the outside of the city limits and then back in. So we were returning into the city limit. Oh, okay. Yeah. Not in Portland. Not in Portland. No. Okay. no. I was like, I mean, I've lived in New York and Boston. <laughs> I've ridden in all those cities, you know, and it's yeah. the issues are the same. But you know, Portland has a great reputation for being a bike-friendly city. It just needs some work on, in the infrastructure, the under the hood kind of I, things that are going to help everybody. When I go to other cities. I'm sure you, uh, transportation commissioner Maps knows this better than me because they're in, in this practice area all the time. I notice how they separate um, the different means of transportation. And Portland has a tendency to commingle all of it together. For better or for worse, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Well, that thought. Thank Thanks you. for being here. Appreciate your being here. Thank you. Next individual, please. Communications item 181. Request of April Fletcher to address council regarding stolen car appeal. They canceled their request. All right. Thank you. Hopefully, we'll hear from April at a different date. Uh, 182, please. Next individual. Request of Alan Combs to address council regarding vendors supporting charter transition. Alan's joining us online. Welcome. Hey, Alan. Alan, you're muted. Yeah, hi, good morning. My name is Alan Combs. I've spoken to you before. Uh, thank you, Mayor Wheeler and commissioners for allowing me to speak. Um, I am here today because of the lack of movement by your city staff to respond to issues I've raised, and that's why I'm got on the agenda. It is timely, but entirely coincidental that Sophie Peel Willamette Week published an article yesterday that raises the very concerns that members of your uh, Government Transition Advisory Committee, or GTAC, raised, as well as I raised in public comments I made before GTAC in December and January. Um, 
And I want to say as a, as a resident of Portland, I, I support using a reasonable amount of city funds to ensure our new methods of election are widely understood and improve the success of November's vote. I recognize the systems of systemic discrimination that require reasoned, targeted communications to make sure underserved populations indeed vote. Uh, young people don't vote in Oregon um, of all kinds, but so targeted communications uh, make a lot of sense. Um, I'll also point out that we'll have over 100 candidates running for city office, and they're going to do a pretty good job of, uh, on that very same goal as well. Um, the conflict identified by GTAC members and residents like me, and now Willamette Week, is not hard to explain. The city has entered into a $675,000 contract with uh, United Way and Portland United for Change. Portland United for Change may officially be connected as a nonprofit, uh, or sorry, may be officially connected with the city as a nonprofit, but it has a political arm, uh, PUFC PAC, that is still active, had transactions throughout 2023 and into 2024. In fact, the Portland United for Change PAC organized a protest outside your very city chambers in July of 2023 when Commissioner Ryan and Commissioner Rubio, sorry, Commissioner uh, Gonzalez, attempted to have a work session on some modest changes to uh, charter reform. That included like making a real uh, um, strong mayor instead of one that doesn't have veto power, which is what uh, was voted in with charter reform. So with that, I ask you, why did the city enter into a contract where taxpayer dollars uh, with an organization that's thwarting the efforts of the commission is actually gonna get paid to educate voters and get out the vote? I support the conditions that were indicated in yesterday's Willamette Week article by uh, Commissioner Ryan's staff that there should be a prohibition on making endorsements. I think it should be further strengthened that the executive team uh, of any such organization not have a person who's running for city council uh, or city office, and nor should any common paid staff between the nonprofit and the political arm uh, exist. Commissioner Rubio, you support um, active dialogue. Will you uh, support those uh, reasonable restrictions? Um, Commissioner Mingus, you support uh, uh, open dialogue. Will you support these restrictions? Or will you just have affiliated organizations thwart what your other commissioners are trying to do through normal city commission activities? Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Ryan. Thanks, Alan. Thank you. Uh, yeah, and thank you, a Mayor. couple of commissioners want to comment. And, and, and thank you, uh, Alan, for being here. Yeah, we, we have been raising this first time I had a meeting, I think it was in November, December, and uh, we'll do everything we can to make sure that the contracts that go out are very objective and fair and not be associated with groups that have had um, pretty strong points of view on the actual outcome of what we voted on last November. So thanks for raising this up. And uh, I think we still have time to do the right thing on this and have the, a fair contract. Thank you so much. And I do appreciate the efforts of GTAC. They've, uh, I mean, it was their, it's what their efforts made this transparent. Thank you. Great. Thank you, sir. Uh, next individual, please, item 183. Request of Law Nguyen to address council regarding homelessness, illegal camping, and dumping. Hi there, can you hear me? Yep, loud and clear, and we see you as well. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, I'm, I apologize. If you hear Disney music in the background, I'm watching my daughter. Um, so my issue is that we've been living here for about five years, and every single year we've had fairly major incidents with the homeless. Um, it's They just camp near our backyard, right next to the railroad, in a wooded area, no less. And there's fires that started that, like, sets the whole forced the area on fire. The fire department had to come out like twice in a month, three, four times in a certain year. Um, every, Almost every other day I come out to my front lawn and I see trash, random clothes, tires, shopping carts just dumped onto my lawn. And, you know, I have to clean it if no one else will. And they just defecate my lawn and I step on it and ruin shoes all the time. And I'm, I'm wondering like, why are we not employing enough like city staff to to take care of this because it, it feels like yes the, the rule is that it's illegal to do this stuff but then every time i contact the police 
um, 311 uh, cleanup crews are like, oh, we're just understaffed. We, we, you know, we can't help you. I mean, they, they don't outright say that. Most of them don't. Some do. But they pretty much said, you know, that you're free to clean it up if you want. <laughs> and it's like, what is the point of me paying $10,000 in, in property tax to get no services when my property is like, you know, vandalized and, and intruded on? And it's just extremely frustrating. I have a daughter, and every time I leave the house, I feel like I have to worry if someone's going to break in, which there had been attempts, like like, like twice in a week. Uh, people come to my law property, and they pulled out my lights. They kick my windows. It's crazy. And I, I have to worry about my house being broken into or people, you know, wrecking my stuff. And I don't know what to do. You know, I, the fire department told me I need to contact the higher up because... If this keeps happening, when they start fires to barbecue their food during the summer when there's like a no fire ban, my house could get burnt down. And I'm not home to call in in time. It, it well could have been. And so I'm just so frustrated as a Portlander. I've lived here with my wife for the past 30 years, and we've always thought that we'd stay here forever. And I legit feel like we, sh we need to leave for our safety. And it's just kind of becoming not sustainable to pay these prices to live in this county and, and not have anything done for us so i mean that's that's mostly all i need to say and i i hope you guys have a way to help um employ this the staff better to help you know us citizens yeah mr win if i if i could comment on this uh, first of all thank you for your testimony um your child's adorable by the way uh, and so I, I know that you're concerned not only about your household, but your family. I empathize with you and many, many Portlanders do as well. I want you to know that we have been very aggressive in trying to address the issues on our streets. And it's not just homelessness, although that's a huge component of it. Bugs. We have created the safe rest villages, the task sites, we've generated about 800 shelter spaces. What's new is not only has the city aggressively worked to help get people off the streets, we now connect them with service. We navigate, we connect them to behavioral health, mental health services, uh, public health services, job training, whatever they need to get back on their own feet. We also have significantly increased our livability issues, the creation of the Portland Environmental Management Office, the huge expansion of the impact reduction program, the work that we're doing in conjunction with the governor and the county chair of the state and the county uh, on the fentanyl crisis as well as the drug, drug crisis generally. Uh, I want you to know that while it looks bad, we are responding we're responding at scale. I can tell you that over the course of the last eight to 10 years, we have now invested hundreds of millions of dollars on this issue. And that's dollars that, that were not invested previously that now compete head to head with police, with fire, with first response, with emergency management. And so we are, we're trying to thread that needle. Uh, what's improved and what gives me hope and what may give you some hope is the partnerships are finally there. This was seen as a public safety problem as recently as five or six years ago. And people would basically thumb their nose at the city and say, why aren't you guys just policing the streets better? And now we finally have the state and the county at the table acknowledging that this is a behavioral health crisis that got its roots 40 years ago when this state by design decided to get out of the mental health business. And it's also as a result of our lack of treatment facilities for people who have substance use disorders. And we finally have attention being paid to that as well. So uh, I personally share your frustration as, as the guy who hears all day, every day about this issue. And I know my colleagues do too, but, but I actually feel really good about the solutions we have in place, the funding that we've provided, the partnerships that we've developed and the significant increase in practitioners who are out there on the streets trying to intervene, prevent, bring people in, solve the problems, and get people back on their feet. So I, I don't want you to leave. I, I guess that's a long way of saying uh, I don't know you, um, but I want you to stay, and I want people like you 
to be here and be part of the fabric of the future of this community. And I appreciate your patience up to this point. I so really can I ask, thank you. What, yeah, what is the response to employees when I call like, you know, various 311 departments and they say, we just don't have enough staff. They're cutting our funding. We used to be like 10 people and now we're down to two and there's just no way to get out to like all these, you know, abandoned vehicles or like, you know, tents that are built up where they shouldn't be. Well, uh, to, to, to be blunt, and I can afford to be blunt, uh, I'm not running for anything. Um, that's an excuse, and it's not acceptable. There is some truth to it. There's no question that the problem currently overwhelms the resources that we have in the field. Uh, but we do have the Portland Reporter function. We do have the Impact Reduction Program. We have the Portland Environmental Management Office. Get in touch with my team directly. I have staff here. Um, I'm pretty easy to find. <laughs> Everybody knows where I live. Uh, get in touch with us, and let's see what we can do. Let's see if, if we can't find a solution to help you and your neighbors out. I appreciate it. I, I appreciate you. Uh, Commissioner Maps, then Commissioner Gonzalez. Um, uh, Mr. Wynn, thank you so much for uh, testifying today. Um, I feel your pain and your frustration. Everyone on this council lives in Portland, and um, I suspect we all face challenges not too dissimilar from yours. Uh, Mr. Mayor, I also I want to thank you for um, inviting Mr. Wynn to contact your office. That was going to be one of my suggestions, uh, too, is I encourage you to reach out to, uh, I was going to invite you to reach out to my staff to help you uh, navigate the system. I sure hope that there's some resources that we can um, to bring to bear on your particular situation. Frankly, the mayor's office is going to be in a better position to um, actually connect you with the resources that we have on the ground. So I really do encourage you to follow up on that. And I was going to do something vaguely unfair, but I think uh, Commissioner uh, Gonzalez is, is already on it. When you told your story, one of the things that perked uh, my ears up was your, the concerns about fire. And um, I hope that someone, uh, and Mr. Commissioner Gonzalez can probably address this, is uh, how to navigate that particular situation um, as a guy who's had to deal with a couple of fire emergencies in my time on council. The risks there are great. Um, so I hope that we can get you some very specific information on how to address that particular um, situation. Uh, but with that, why don't I um, lower my hand and let our fire commissioner um, speak, because I know uh, um, Renee would like to talk to you. Commissioner uh, Gonzalez. So, Mr. Wynn, thank you for testifying. I want to hit on a couple of points high level. Um, <laughs> We have created uh, over a long period of time an environment in the city of Portland that um, simply attracts too much of this behavior. And I have to commend the mayor for taking real steps in recent years to, to try and clean up the mess. Uh, but we sit in a state that ties the city's hands on cleaning up camps. I wish city employees would mention that more, but we are actually limited by, by state law in how we approach cleaning up camps. We're uh, currently facing an injunction by a Multnomah County judge that prevents us from cleaning up further. Uh, we are spending $13 million a year just on cleanups right now. It is eating our budget, uh, this environment. And uh, yet yeah, we're pushing forward. And so, uh, but we absolutely need help. I think sometimes the mayor has been too kind and doesn't take enough credit for the efforts he's made uh, in an impossible environment right now uh, at both the state and certain extent county level. Uh, and it's a, it really welcoming this uh, a, a behavior and certain aspects of it. We're still gonna have to lean forward with compassion and getting people services and shelter, but we have to stop this environment that attracts and perpetuates this. And so um, I, I can speak to the, the fires in homeless camps issue. Uh, it's a mammoth problem. You know, 40% of our fire deaths, injuries, and fire volume is coming from homeless camps right now. It's absolutely clogging our system. Uh, but one of the challenges we face uh, when a fire uh, uh, team is called out to a homeless camp is they are often threatened. Uh, it's unlike responding to a house fire where people are happy to see them uh, in a homeless camp fire. They often don't want to see the fire department there. They face physical threats. Uh, so it is a substantial challenge uh, right now on how to navigate this. They're having to make some tough calls on what they put out and, which, and what they don't pull out, put out. And 
it's absurd. I mean, I'm, I'm telling you, it's a, it, it, I wish we weren't putting them in that position. Those are all illegal fires. It's never legal in the city of Portland to have an outside fire. And yet we have to make choices based on safety of firefighters as to which ones that we hold the line on and which ones we can't. And uh, if they perceive that there's a threat to someone else's structure, they'll put it out immediately, uh, regardless of the risk. But they... Uh, the rest of the time, they have to sort of balance this risk of threats to firefighters uh, versus the threat by the fire. So uh, I'm I'm as frustrated as you are by that situation. Uh, it is uh, the bottom line. The only way we're going to get out of this as a community is we stop uh, allowing uh, unsanctioned camping. And when I say allow, I want to be crystal clear. The city of Portland has banned outdoor camping. It has attempted to put in substantial restrictions on it, but we continue to face hurdles in the courts at the state legislature on cleaning up our city and um but we'll keep fighting and uh appreciate you testifying so can i ask where, yeah. who outside of the city um you know you mentioned the county and the state that's kind of tying your hands and doing what the citizens here want what, do, is there a place for me to reach out to state st your st your state legislature sorry we're having some sound adjustments here um when we're talking about the restrictions on the city's ability to clean up camps, there's three different statutes uh, imposed by the state of Oregon legislature, uh, including House Bill 3115. And for those who are listening at home, you should all be paying attention to what House Bill 3115 does, uh, because it is uh, really tying the city's hands right now and how we clean up camps. It doesn't mean we're not cleaning up camps. I mean, crystal clear, we're spending $13 million a, a year on it. Um, but the frequency we can clean up camps, the method we have to, the, the, the hurdles we have to jump through uh, are all impacted by uh, three pieces of legislation. So I'd start with your state legislators. I mean, I, that represent your district and uh, let them know that you're concerned about this, uh, that the state's facing real proof, uh, state is preempting the city's abilities to address these issues uh, and it needs to be fixed. Okay, thank you. I'm just taking some notes here. All right, thank you. Appreciate thank, you. All. Thank you, and Mr. Wynn, um, what One more commissioner wants to speak up here, but also my office, I think, is already reaching out to you. I'm hearing from Megan, so you'll you'll get something from us. For, is it an email that you sent? Um, Sky is going to reach out to them. Oh, today. great, perfect. perfect. Skyler perfect. from our our team is going to reach out to you today, Commissioner Ryan. Yes, good to see you again, Mr. Wynn. And you can also testify at the county. They have. Um, their meetings on Tuesday and Thursday mornings. I believe they have public testimony on Tuesdays. Address. What? Address. I didn't hear that. But What's anyway. the address, Commissioner? It, I, the, 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 the question out there was, what was the address? Well, I know. You get some, your office, the mayor's office will give you the number to call at the county. You've been very compelling. It's the second time we've seen you. Your testimony is awesome. So I hope that you can deliver such truth also to the county. Thanks so much. Thank right. you. Thank you. Uh, next individual, please. Item 184. Request of Nora Kingsley to address council regarding homelessness crisis. Welcome. Thanks for Hi. being here. Good morning. It's an honor to get to speak to you guys today. My name is Nora Kingsley, and I was born and raised here in the Pacific Northwest. Since graduating from high school, I've been a proud Oregonian, continuing my education and becoming a working taxpayer here. Unfortunately, today I'm here to talk about the ongoing humanitarian crisis happening in Gaza. I'm asking that you, your honor, and respected council members pass a resolution calling for a ceasefire. I'd like to ask you to think of the people you care about most in this world. Just think about them for a moment. If your federal taxes were going toward jeopardizing their existence, how hard would you fight to protect them? What if every hour that you worked for your company, you were helping to fund the destruction of your beloved? What if every purchase you made, you gave a percentage toward the destruction of what you love most? Would you do something if you could? I'm asking you to look at this with your heart. 
As Americans, we cannot deny the great power and influence that we hold over millions of people on the other side of the world. You all here in front of me, your power holds an exponentially greater influence than mine and my fellow community members. Seattle and even my small hometown have added their voice to the growing number of cities that have called for a ceasefire in Gaza. It is time for Portland to join the voices of our neighbors against the humanitarian crisis that we have helped to fuel. I'm sure we would all agree that human life is priceless and sacred. The earth is sacred. Every taxpayer in this country, with or without their consent, is funding the destruction of countless human lives and irreparable damage to our planet. Gaza needs us. Gaza needs our voice. We live in a country where we as citizens all have a voice. We have opportunities to work for change and fight for what's right. But you five, as elected council members, have a stronger voice, a power that is rep meant to represent us all here today, meant to represent our city. Portland must pass a resolution calling for an immediate ceasefire, as well as the release of all hostages now. Three months ago, on November 20th, our Senator Jeff Merkley made his stance heard. He said, too many civilians have died, and we must value each and every child equally, whether they are Israeli or Palestinian. Since his statement, twice as many more innocent civilians have died in Gaza. A ground invasion of Rafah, where more than 1.5 million Palestinians are taking refuge, is imminent. That's more than twice the population of Portland gathered in a tiny area. Mayor Wheeler, you made a statement in a recent council meeting that you were hopeful for peace. Please demonstrate that with action by calling for a ceasefire in Gaza and release of all Israeli hostages. It's time to take a vote today. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and I, I have a question, actually. Please. Um, and I, I truly don't know the answer to this question. And so I'm, I, and I, I don't want to put you on the spot. If you don't know, you don't know. I might uh, not. I, I heard substantial rumors through credible news sources as late as Friday mm -hmm. that the ceasefire that you were looking for and the hostage release are imminent, potentially as soon as this week. Have you heard anything to that effect? I have heard rumors of that, but there have been countless rumors for four months that that may be coming. Every single day, hundreds of Palestinians are dying. If a ceasefire comes tomorrow, would you not be embarrassed that you hadn't voiced your support for that and been on the right side of history? You want to be the mayor of a city that had no say to, in to, that? To be clear, uh, yes. I have not been silent on this issue. And again, mm -hmm. I'll refer you to the previous statements I've made, but I'll, I'll say it again. Yes. I want peace in the Middle East. I want the fighting to stop. I want the hostages returned. I want there to be a credible, sustainable, long-term solution for peace between Gaza yeah. and Israel so that they can coexist peacefully. Now, I'm not there. Uh, I don't get to participate in the negotiations. Yeah. Um, frankly, I wish I did. I, yeah. I actually think this is probably one of the most important things happening on our planet today. And it speaks volumes to the ability of people to be able to get along and coexist, even if they have different views and philosophies. Um, so that, that is the direction in which I'm pulling. I'm not obviously privy to the day-to-day -day activities as perhaps our United States senators are. I'm, I'm here mm. working on uh, the good work of the people of the city. But, but I hear you, and I want you to know yeah. I share... Uh, the desire that I think we all share for this to end and for there to be peace. Thank you. And, and um, I appreciate your being here. Thank absolutely. you. Absolutely. Thank you. Could I say one more thing yeah, of shortly? Course. You bet. Um, 
you know, I don't mean to undermine the powerful statements that you have made. I do really appreciate that. Um, some of the statements that you've made, you know, that I agree with all of them, it seems like more the sort of thing that community members would voice as their opinion while they feel slightly helpless to what they could do. But they feel, I want peace in the Middle East. They feel, I wish I could do something more. But you guys here are the council members that can make more of an impact than just a statement in a council meeting, but you can make a statement and a call to action to the United States government. That is your power. And you can't just send thoughts and prayers. That's not your job. Thank you. Thank take, you. take care. Yeah, appreciate you being here. Thank you. Thank it's good you. seeing you. You too. Oh, God. And that completes communications, correct? We'll move to the consent agenda. Have any items been pulled off of consent? No items have been pulled. Please call the roll on the consent agenda. Rubio. Aye. Ryan. Aye. Gonzalez. Aye. Lutz. Aye. Miller. Aye. The consent agenda is adopted. We'll move to the first time certain item, please 185. Proclaim February 27, 2024 to be the 20th anniversary of Insight. Colleagues, today I have the honor of introducing this proclamation celebrating the incredible work of Insight. 20 years ago in February of 2004, Scott Hatley co-founded Insight. Insight is an organization committed to unlocking the potential of people with disabilities through education as well as employment opportunities. Scott is a long-term Oregonian, a fourth-generation Oregonian, a product of our local public school system, and a University of Portland alumni. He also happens to be the executive director of Insight. Scott, we really appreciate you being here today. I appreciate the work that you and Insight have been doing for now 20 years. Your leadership has directly contributed to the better path for our fellow Portlanders who are too often overlooked or left out. I'm now gonna pass the microphone to Commissioner Ryan, who will say a few brief remarks before turning it over to Scott. Commissioner Ryan. Thank you, Mayor. Scott, it's so wonderful to see you here today as the founder, as the inspiration and the builder of Insight's mission. And hello, Mr. Dan Floyd, a board leader of Insight and a community member who is now also on the Portland Children's Levy. We approved that a few months ago. Yeah. There he is in person. It's been my honor to turn the microphone over to you, Scott and Dan, so go ahead and come forward. And the floor is yours. All right, well, fantastic. Um, just wanted to say how honored we are to be able to receive this recognition from all of you. Um, and uh, we really could not have been at this spot and being here 20 years later without the, the full support of the community and all the sponsors, all the donors, all the partners we've had, even past staff members, current staff members, past board members, current board members, um, and just being part of this journey with us. Um, so as I saw in the early remarks, uh, you know, Insight, is a product of the city of Portland and Portland. And we hatched the idea the co-founders um, with disabilities and also just passionate about um, the community um, and what we're doing, um, saw the need for the work we're doing at Insight. And so we launched it um, not too long after we graduated. And um, it's been quite the journey. Um, for me personally, I grew up with muscular dystrophy. Um, some of you on the council have heard my story um, and I was diagnosed at four and a half, and my parents were kind of at a crossroads there. It's, they had been played this hand of cards that was maybe not the best hand. Um, and so they had to kind of pick up the cards they had and play it the best they could. And so that's what we've always strived to do, and it's worn off on me, is to just leverage the obstacles, turning lemons into lemonade, um, all the way to awaken opportunities. Um, and so... University of Portland Insight has been that opportunity. Um, and I would say I was fortunate. I grew up just outside of the city in the suburbs, and there was that expectation culture, and that really up 
applied, then I, you know, everybody that I knew was going to college. And so I'm just kind of like, okay, I'm going to keep going. I didn't want to be left behind. Um, and so the insight journey, we started actually, and you'll appreciate this, Commissioner Ryan, um, we gave our very first scholarship um, to a student at uh, Roosevelt High School. And she since graduated a long time ago, uh, went to Portland State, also here in Portland, and then um, ended up working is at the, the Portland Public School District uh, in the admin office. And so cool to see that. And now since that first one, we've given over a thousand scholarships and close to a million dollars of impact um, in scholarship dollars going to post-secondary. Um, we've served about 11,000 people over um, students, job seekers, um, individuals with disabilities over our period of time, um, and had hundreds of employers from the city of Portland um, that have helped support the students and job seekers we've had. Um, so I just want to take a quick moment to just talk about the context of why Insights do what we do. Um, and so we all, most of us, I think, in this room, or all of us, have been alive when the ADA, Americans with Disabilities Act, was passed back in 1990. So we're approaching 35 years here. And um, the fact of the matter is, um, you know, I think that I believe the ADA achieved the objectives that the founders and the authors intended as far as the built environment, all accessibility. And we're in a fortunate time for people with disabilities to be living right now with all the technology and all the built environment. But I still think we're just scratching the surface of the piece that I would call changing hearts and minds. We, there's still more work to be done there. Um, and case in point, the 2022 um, stats from the Bureau of Labor show that only about two out of 10 people with disabilities are actually in the workforce full time versus seven out of 10 individuals with no documented disability. So um, for us, we really feel like it's the work that we can do to help that. And we see it as twofold. First, how do we help people with disabilities leverage the obstacles they face in their life? So providing the resources, the tools, the programs, whatever they need to totally be able to go after their dreams and awaken their opportunities. And then the second fold, which I think is as valuable, is the piece on the changing hearts and minds. How can we change culture in the community? And um, I still think there's a bit of discomfort around disability. We'll often say that it's the one minority anybody could join in a split second. And so with that being the case, we want to kind of build the case and create the invitation for people to have um, more awareness and engage with us. Um, and so we feel like that's the important piece, the invitation part, not because I think, um, you know, we just because we've become adults, uh, doesn't mean we don't still have those six-year-old questions and curiosities, but we don't always have the environment or the, the place to figure out how to ask that. And so we want to just promote that dialogue. So um, as I just wrap up, I just, uh, you know, we're, it's been 20 years. There's so much more work to be done, and um, we're excited for what's ahead in the next 20 years. Well done. Mayor Wheeler, City Council. My name is Dan Floyd, and I am a longtime board member of Insight and happy to be here today. I also want to thank you for your, your leadership. Obviously, you've got an incredibly difficult job, and thank you for that. And thank you for taking the time today to, to hear from us. And Mayor Wheeler, you hit on a lot of the points I was going to make about Scott and, and, and being from Oregon and staying, staying in Oregon. And Scott did such a good job about talking about the organization and, and all the contributions that it's making. But I think it's also time that we recognize Scott, and, and Scott didn't talk a lot about himself, but to <clears throat> remind the people here today and in the organization that Scott is the founder, and he's uh, a great living example of what the mission is all about. And again, from, like you said, he's from, he's from the public school series. He went to the University of Portland, stayed in the community to inspire and to lead. And because of that, 20 years in the making and, and so much more that, that Scott wants to do. Also, it's such a big moment for Insight this, this entire year and the celebration will go on, but to this particular moment is a huge moment for Insight and we, we thank you for that. Uh, finally, just as far as the, the Insight is concerned, Scott being a living example of that, you just see what Scott does and he, and he, and he talked about his parents and a hand that they were dealt. Scott is representing 
people with disabilities, both visible and invisible. And he's showing that you can have impactful relationships, graduate high school, graduate college, have a fulfilling career, and then stay in the community and lead. So I want to recognize Scott and Insight, and thank you all for your leadership as well. And Scott made me say all of that. <laughs> he did, he would be, he'd be very uncomfortable with saying any of that, but I think Commissioner Ryan and Commissioner Rubio know that Scott would never do that himself, and he deserves a ton of recognition, and, and uh, we appreciate you. Thank you, Scott. Commissioner Maps. Oh, uh, thank you very much. I just want to take a moment to thank, actually, why don't I start with Commissioner Ryan and the mayor for sponsoring this proclamation. And I want to thank Scott um, and uh, Insight for all the work they do. And I also want to say this, um, I'm delighted to join this council in celebrating the 20th anniversary of Insight. As we learned today, um, Insight was founded, I think, on February 27th which must be the, uh, yeah, the 27th of 2024. Uh, you folks serve uh, more than 11,000 people with disabilities here in the Portland area, offering programs on everything from education to employment to independence. Um, this work is important because, um, as we have heard too often, Portlanders with disabilities face barriers when trying to participate in the civic life of our city. And too often, uh, Portlanders with uh, disabilities confront obstacles when trying to get a good education, as we heard vividly, and too often Portlanders with disabilities face barriers in the workplace. In fact, um, today unemployment rates amongst the disabled are three times higher, as we've heard, than um, unemployment rates for the population at large. And when uh, folks with disabilities do find work, too often they are paid less than their um, able-bodied co-workers, um, and that is true even here in Portland, where about 22% of residents live with some kind of disability, and about one-third of disabled Portlanders live below the poverty line. Now, um, colleagues, I, I think these just difficult facts are why it's important that we reinvigorate our efforts to eliminate the barriers that block disabled Portlanders from fully participating in our labor markets, in our educational systems, and in our civic life. And that is why I am proud to join you in celebrating the 20th anniversary of Insight. Thank you for all the work you do, and thank you for being here today. Thank you. Commissioner uh, Rubio. Thank you. Um, I want to thank Commissioner Ryan for bringing this important proclamation forward. And also, I want to thank you, Scott and Dan, for your very thoughtful remarks today. And for the past 20 years, Insight's work um, has consistently centered this very important segment of our community. And you've reached thousands and thousands of Portlanders and Oregonians. Um, and you have programs that are tailored uniquely to our community. And that's what makes Insight special and really stand out. And I've had the honor of knowing Scott by way of introduction uh, from Commissioner Ryan um, on our community work and Dan on our work together in years past. And um, yes, I agree with you, Dan, that Scott is highly competent, very thoughtful leader who does not, um, who's so humble about all his tremendous accomplishments. And Portland is so incredibly lucky, and we're so proud to have you in our community and leading on all our behalf. Um, we're, we're a better city for it, and um, you're a thoughtful ad advocate who leads with integrity and with grit and with perseverance, and so um, we should all strive to be like you. Um, I was impressed then and continue to be impressed by uh, your work, Insight's work, to eliminate the st stigma surrounding this community and raise more um awareness around people with barriers um, that offer the same, if not more, value to um, a lot of programs and contribution in the, in the community. Um, and there's really an opportunity cost for all of us when we, when we miss out on this inclusion. So um, you've proven that. Um, you've proven that when we foster that familiarity, we remove the fear that, that leads to judgment and exclusion. So I just want to thank you, Scott and insight for consistently being that leader that we need at the state level and the local level, level for these critical issues in Portland. And uh, bravo for showing that we can all improve the lives of people with barriers through action, through radical inclusion and culture, culture change. So thank you. Thank you.
Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Gonzalez. I just want to thank the mayor, Commissioner Ryan, for bringing this proclamation forward. Uh, thank you, Scott and Dan, and the Insight team for the work you do every day to make a difference in the lives of so many. Uh, living with a disability can present many challenges, and facing those barriers of overcoming those obstacles is truly a team effort and with aspiration and uh, not just grievance, which I'm gonna circle back to in a second. Uh, Portland is so far fortunate to have insight as a resource for many who face these each and every day. From helping folks build their own independence, uh, offering critical lifeline like uh, scholarships, employment connections, financial and housing assistance, insight truly does it all. And we are fortunate for their contribution to our city. Um, I do want to highlight congratulations on 20 years of dedication to this cause. And I know I speak for all Portlanders when I express my sincere gratitude for all you do. And just looking at your own language, uh, reaching their full potential, uh, the emphasis on that uh, for each human being, every Portlander, uh, I don't know if we can say that enough uh, and emphasize that enough. Moving the world, expecting great contributions with people experiencing disabilities. Again, these aren't my words, these are your words, and it's beautiful. Uh, and we need more of that theme for those suffering uh, both with disabilities and those without in our city. So thank you for being leaders and aspiring and pushing and reaching. I'm happy to support this proclamation today. Our city is truly a better place because of your efforts, and we thank you immensely. Thank you. Thank you, and before I turn this over to Commissioner Ryan to read the proclamation, um, I, I want to make very clear, Commissioner Ryan led this effort to bring this proclamation forward this morning, although I am very, very grateful for it and <clears throat> strongly support the intent behind it. And Scott, as with everybody else, thank you for your continued leadership. I, you've done amazing things and you have amazing things ahead. And we're glad to have this opportunity to share it. Commissioner Ryan. Thank you so much, Mayor. Thank you, colleagues. It's, uh, you can tell we're we're just so honored that you're both here today. And it's a pleasure to see both of you. Um, when the milestone came to my attention, I was struck by the fact that you, Scott, have been out there doing this, as we know now, for 20 years. And then I didn't realize I connected with you towards the beginning of that, uh, at that building. So it's uh, one of those moments where you just kind of pinch yourself and realize, one, life goes really fast, and then two, what, um, how, what a gratitude you have when you connect with someone like yourself and stay in relationship with you over these last uh, 20 years. Your hard work and dedication you've built in the community for people who don't always have a voice is so consistent. Your humility um, is such a missing trait in leadership today and needed and wanted. So thank you for just um, being you, letting the light come to you and everyone around you. Um, you've just given so much hope and inspiration to people who didn't have it before. and. The data is really impressive. Your impact is also rippled beyond Portland. And I think we speak for all of us that you really make Portland proud that we have um, insight located in Portland, but it's having a, a reach well beyond. Um, I know it helps when you continue to um, cultivate amazing board members and we'll count Dan Floyd as one of those, right? Okay. Um, anyway, what an incredible achievement. And I wanna also to pause for a moment and, and thank the parents of um, people with um, different ables, different abilities. I can't recall your mother's name, but she's behind you, right? No, actually, she's not here today. She's but not here today. She might be watching online. OK, Susan. all right, mom and dad, um, we, we yeah. really salute you. I've seen them so many times out in the community, and uh, they're so proud of you, and they always show up. And I know in my life, um, my friends that have uh, children that have the same different able challenges, um, they really do go an extra mile. And of course, they just do it. But I think we have to continue to always give them uh, proper attention at this time. Well, and I wouldn't be where I am or able to do what I did without my parents and the support they provided and making sure I've gone everywhere that I need to go. So right. I appreciate that shout out. So this is like, if you're watching, we're, we're really sending you a lot of love right now. <laughs> um, I also was struck by the two out of 10 in the workforce right now. and. That's something we all should aspire to see in the next milestone go up. And let's let Portland be the leader nationally on something like that. That would really be um, good for our city. And with you and leadership, I know that we can get there. We all came together when we were talking about community around a mission that was about all children and youth by age 25 
would have the skill sets to be economically mobile for the rest of their lives. And that's true freedom. And um, you always inspired that by the work that you did at Insight. So it's an honor to know you. It's an honor to call both you and Dan my friend. And with that, I go, I will now read the proclamation. The whereases begin. Whereas the city of Portland affirms and is committed to the principles of engagement, inclusion, and equity of opportunity for all persons with disabilities. And whereas Insight works to achieve its vision of moving the world, expecting great contributions with people experiencing disabilities and has been actively striving to meet its mission of unlocking the potential of people with disabilities as a nonprofit organization since it was founded on February 27, 2004. And whereas Insight has been intentionally working to change hearts and minds, leverage obstacles, and unlock potential with people experiencing disabilities, and whereas Insight has established a strong record in the Portland community serving over 11,000 students and job seekers with disabilities through scholarships, internships, job placements, coaching services, career events, and more. And whereas it takes the collective effort of the entire communities, including government, business, nonprofits, and educators in Portland and throughout the state of Oregon to work together to bring forth greater disability awareness and work to, toward greater success for all Oregonians with disabilities. And whereas the current executive director and Insight co-founder is a fourth generation Oregonian, graduate of Oregon Public Schools and graduate of the University of Portland. And whereas February 27th, 2024, 2024 celebrates the 20th anniversary of Insight, an organization doing this work and founded on unlocking the potential of people with disabilities so they can fully reach their potential through education and employment opportunities. Now, therefore, I, Ted Wheeler, Mayor of the City of Portland, Oregon, the City of Roses, do hereby proclaim February 27th, 2024, to be the 20th anniversary of Insight in Portland and encourage all residents to observe this day. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. Thank you, everyone. Photos? <clears throat> we do, can we do a photo of them? Sure. Yeah. Where should we do it? Okay. Yeah. Do you know where we are? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Up there? Yeah. On that. That's the emergency declaration. Or that's the, the emergency manager. Yeah. yeah. Uh, 186, which is a report. Appoint Amy Vos and Christian McCombs to the Development Review Advisory Committee for terms to expire February 27, oh, 2027. Commissioner Rubio. Thank you, Mayor. Colleagues, today I am pleased to bring forward two appointments to the Development Review Advisory Committee, or DRAC. DRAC was established in June 2001 as the city's primary advisory body regarding development review. The DRAC seeks to foster a timely, predictable, and accountable development review process and advocates for the consistent and fair application of regulations. The committee is composed of 17 members representing groups with interests in development and development review processes. DRAC members are appointed by the City Council to one three-year term with the possibility of serving a second three-year term. 
I'm pleased to present Amy Vos and Christian McCombs for appointment to three-year terms as DRAC members. So I'll now turn it over to DRAC liaison, Ross Curran. Good morning. Good morning, Mayor and Commissioners. Thank you, Commissioner Rubio. Uh, my name is Ross Curran. I'm an employee with the Bureau of Development Services, and I am our liaison to the Development Review Advisory Committee. Um, just a couple of quick comments about uh, our current membership levels and then just a little bit about both Amy and Kristen, oh, uh, Kristen um, uh, who are both uh, in attendance today. I'm presenting if there are any questions that are available to answer those. Um, with these two appointments, the DRAC will be, all members will be, all seats will be filled. Uh, we do have in May six vacancy coming, coming up which we're actively recruiting for and have other recruitments uh, in the book. So I will be coming in front of you again here in the near future. The first uh, uh, appointment we have today is Amy Vos. Um, we're asking to nominate Amy to the land use planning professional position. Amy is a principal architect at the Saj Architecture. I may have mispronounced that name um, and has been based in Portland since 2006. She does a lot of long range facility planning for local schools, as well as other large public sector clients. She works in both in the architectural as well as land use planning realms in the project she works on. And Amy looks forward to providing feedback on how to make it easier to move projects through the permitting process. Kristen McCombs is nominated to the public works permit customers position. Kristen is a professional civil, civil engineer and senior member of uh, Humber Design Groups, or HDG. She brings over 10 years of experience with the city's public works as well as building permit process. Uh, Kristen, is, Kristen is well versed in the ongoing efforts to make improvements uh, to our permitting system as well as um, contributions to numerous affordable housing project. She's also been an active member of the Development Review Advisory uh, committee's public works subcommittee. Um, both of these candidates bring a wealth of relevant experience and important perspective to DRAC, and we are pleased to present them for appointment. And if there's any questions for me, and uh, that is the end of my presentation. Commissioner Ryan. Oh, it was up from the last one, but I, how many uh, are open in May? There's six. Six? Yeah. Okay. And a little bit of attachment because I recruited some of them. Sure. Um, maybe I'll find out from you, Commissioner Rubio, which ones are turning off. So, yeah. Proud of the work that you all do at, at Thank DRAC. You. Yeah. Thanks. So. All right. Very good. Do we have public testimony on this report? No one signed up. I'll entertain a motion to accept the report. So moves. Commissioner Maps moves. Second. Commissioner Rubio seconds. Any further discussion on the report? Seeing none, please call the roll. Rubio. Uh, thank you, Ross, so much for your presentation. And thank you to Amy and Christian for their service on this committee. I vote aye on the, these appointments. Ryan. Bridge Crane, what's up? Uh, if you look at the smart sheet, number 186, I don't know why it's in reverse order. Are, are you signed up to testify on this item? Yes. OK, we'll suspend the vote. Go ahead. Um, Thank you. Uh, I do, uh, unlike some of the testimony we had on last week's, uh, I thank these people. <laughs> and uh, I do want to encourage you on these items to maybe when somebody has become uh, professionally credentialed to go ahead and I don't know if it's a citywide style manual policy or something, but add their credentials. So if somebody's a professional engineer, uh, we can have PE after their name. If Ms. Vo's architect uh, has joined the Academy of Architects to put the AIA in there to, uh, and gives us a little bit more fluid and confidence. The other thing, of course, is the difficulty of their jobs is within your hands and the hands of the future city council as far as the complexity, lack of complexity of various design and guidances and waivers. Um, and the uh, issue that's most in my mind is that Previously, this council has says there's going to be some accommodation for primarily corporate landlords who try and adjust their properties to maybe have other residential functions. Um, but we're spending $16,000 on pods 
while commercial real estate va- space is vacant and you know, the governor had a 45-person commission led by the chairman of Standard Insurance. I assure you that there are working toilets on empty floors in Standard's building that could give better accommodation than the horrible things that happen at TPI's mass congregate shelters. Converting a resident off, uh, these people, I'm sure if you asked them, could tell you that converting an office building to luxury apartments is complicated because people like to control where the water flow and stuff goes. But putting people in cost-effective shelter, exercising your fiduciary responsibility to not spend, as the county does, $70 on an individual every day to put them in a, land, in a hotel owned by an out-of-state landlord and contract to do that for five years, listen to the people that are, don't just have them do their DRAC work but build smart, humane, cost-effective solutions for the problems the city is facing. Uh, Thank you very much. Thank you. And we'll continue the roll. Ryan. Commissioner Ryan. Back to the vote. Okay. I approve all these appointments. I would I. Gonzalez. I just want to thank uh, folks for stepping up to serve the city of Portland. I vote aye. Maps. Yeah, I want to thank everyone for agreeing to serve on these important committees. I vote aye. Wheeler. This is uh, an important committee. It's a technical committee. It's difficult work. The pay is no good. We're grateful that people are willing to step forward to serve. So I certainly support these appointments, and I'm appreciative that people want to take the time to help the city move forward. I vote aye. The report is accepted. The appointments are approved. Thank you very much. Thank you all. And colleagues, uh, 187, which is our proclamation of Black History Month, we're going to move it slightly later in the agenda so we can have it right before the reception. Uh, That has been a request. We'll see if we can get through the rest of this agenda as quickly as possible. Uh, Item 189 from the regular agenda, please. This is a first reading of a non-emergency ordinance. Amend Title 15 Emergency Code to align with the amended city charter approved by voters in Portland Measure 26-228. Yeah, uh, folks, sorry. Um, It's extremely rare, I know, but from time to time I do make mistakes. Uh, This is a second reading of a non-emergency ordinance clarifying the roles of the executive and legislative branches in managing emergencies in the city of Portland. Uh, I certainly want to thank the Charter Transition Team Project Coordinator, Diana Shiplett, and Director of Portland Bureau of Emergency Management, Shada Mudd, for joining us last week to walk us through the changes. Is there any further business on this side? Yeah, I actually have Perhaps. some. Um, Mr. Mayor, after first reading, I think it has become apparent to me that there were some conversations that should have taken place between uh, our infrastructure bureaus and uh, the folks who were designing this particular um, um, ordinance. Uh, Those conversations didn't happen. Operationally, I think where we're at is our emergency um, planners um, and our our operations folks on uh, certain types of emergencies are not exactly on the same page. Uh, this is a process problem, um, and um, we need to have more conversation ar- around this. Uh, my recommendation um, would be that we pass this, and then I would ask probably the mayor and Commissioner Gonzalez uh, to support staff level, continued staff level conversations so that the folks who are planning uh, emergency responses and the folks who are actually on the ground can work together. I wouldn't have any objections, but do you have a, a, any concept of the uh, substantive concerns with the code language that are? I think, in particular, um, number one, I think there was, frankly, my, my infrastructure people weren't, weren't tuned into this particular ordinance until very late in the game, as in after the first reading. That's frankly something my office should have done better on to make sure that our teams work together. And then they're saying uh, some concerns around, I think. Um, literally just flow and how things operate on the ground when you're actually dealing with a snow emergency or an earthquake or, or whatnot. Um, I, unfortunately, I'm not in a good position to offer an articulate 
uh, explanation of what the concerns are. But um, I know we skipped a step in terms of having um, appropriate dialogue at a staff level. I'll take responsibility for that. I also want to raise the red flag here and say there's some more work that we need to we need to do. We can move forward with this, but I do hope that we can have uh, continued conversations so infrastructure and um, the rest of the city can be on the same page. Great. Uh, Diana, do you have any comment on that? Hi, good morning, Mayor and Commissioners. Uh, yes, we, I did receive record. an email. Sorry, yes, I, I oh, sorry. sorry. My name is Diana Shiplett. I'm a project coordinator with the Charter Transition Team. Uh, and uh, I did receive an email yesterday from the infrastructure bureaus regarding this, and I have responded to it. Mostly it was a lack of clarity on the differences between our current form of government and the future form of government, but I'm happy to continue to meet with them and to uh, adjust any questions or listen to any questions and hopefully respond to them as we move forward. Would, would that be helpful? Yeah, let's keep these conversations going. Um, uh, my team, I should have done a better job to make sure that we were communicating with Diana and my teams understood what was going on in this space. Didn't happen. I could have let it go, but frankly, when an emergency happens, I really want our planners and our operations people to be on the same page, and we should just pause and have those conversations now, um, frankly, before the earthquake comes. Okay, good. Just include parks in the infrastructure. Sure, absolutely. Yeah, thanks. Good. Uh, so, Diana, you've, you've heard the request. It seems like a reasonable request, and we'll take it from there. This is second reading of a non-emergency ordinance. Any further business? Seeing none, call the roll. Rubio. This is an integral part of our city's government transition. I want to thank Shad, Diana, and the rest of the transition team for bringing these amendments forward. I vote aye. Ryan. Yeah, this is definitely a system that needs improvement. So yeah. I'm glad we're acknowledging that and I'm glad we're focused on it. Uh, the proof will be in the how we deliver and implement this. So I vote aye. Gonzalez. This is an important step in charter reform implementation. Uh, it's essential for community resilience and our ability to respond to the crises that may come. I vote aye. Maps. Um, I want to express my gratitude to everyone who worked on this, uh, and I also really appreciate uh, Diana, my colleagues, uh, um, for being open to having continuing dialogue about how um, all the bureaus in the city can work together in the uh, case of an emergency. I vote aye, and I look forward to those conversations happening. Wheeler. Uh, I, I appreciate Commissioner Mapp's uh, comments with regard to the infrastructure bureaus. I think uh, more collaboration and communication can only improve things. So I, I think it's great. I vote aye. The ordinance is adopted. Item 190, this is a report. Accept bid of $7,371,394 from Iron Horse Excavation Incorporated for the downtown Old Town Market Madison Sewer Rehabilitation Project. Colleagues, the Bureau of Environmental Services needs to rehabilitate or replace 9,500 feet of deteriorated sewer pipes, maintenance holes, and service laterals throughout the city's downtown sewer system. We've seen this in other parts of the city. We have Nico Taylor here to give us a brief presentation on this side. Good morning, Mayor and Commissioners. Oh, Kathleen. Uh, hello. Um, I am presenting for, for BICO. I'm Kathleen Brennis Marua, uh, for the record, and I'm here to recommend authorization to enter into a contract with Iron Horse Excavation Incorporated doing business as Oxbow Construction for the downtown Old Town Market Madison Sewer Rehabilitation Project. City Council approved Ordinance 191487 on October 18th, 2023. The engineer's estimate for this project was 9076000 and the confidence level was high. Procurement Services issued the invitation to bid on November 3rd, 2023, and three bids were received on December 7th, 2023. Iron Horse Excavation Incorporated submitted the lowest responsive bid in the amount of 7 million. $371,394, which is approximately 19% under the estimate. The city's aspirational 20% subcontractor and supplier utilization goal applied to this project, to this contract. Iron Horse has committed to subcontract approximately 21% to contractors certified by the state's certification office for business inclusion and diversity, as identified in the report before you. Iron Horse is self-performing the remaining 79% of the work. Iron Horse 
is located in Trapdale, Oregon, is a state certified woman owned contractor and is in full compliance with all city contracting requirements. Um, unless you have questions about the project, I believe the project manager Jay Brannon is in attendance. If not, I recommend that you accept this report and authorize execution of the contract. Any questions? Public testimony. Uh, no one signed up. I'll entertain a motion. So moved. moved. Commissioner Gonzalez moves. Commissioner Mapp seconds. Any further discussion on the report? Seeing none, please call the roll. Rubio. Thank you for your presentation, Kathleen. And I'm also heartened to see this entire project be awarded to a firm that exceeds our, our city's aspirational goals. I vote aye. Ryan. Yes, thank you, Kathleen. Good to see you. And thrilled that we did reach the COVID requirement at 20.72%. I vote aye. Gonzalez. Aye. Maps. Aye. Wheeler. Aye. The report is accepted. Item 191, emergency ordinance. Pay settlement of Grace Dechold bodily injury lawsuit for $25,000 involving the Portland Police Bureau. Deputy City Attorney Caroline Turco and Senior Claims Analyst Karen Bond are here to walk us through the ordinance. Welcome. Thank you for being here. Good morning. I'm Karen Bond, Senior Claims Analyst in Risk Management. And with me today is Caroline Turco, who will do the presentation. Good morning, Mayor. Morning. Good morning, Commissioners. My name is Caroline Turco, and I'm an employee with the Portland City Attorney's Office. This case involves a police use of force arising from the George Floyd protests in the summer of 2020. The, pl the plaintiff, Grace Deitschold, was attending a protest with their mother, Dika Deitschold, at Peninsula Park. They had foam shields with them and were asked to hand them over as officers had instructed the protesters that weapons were not allowed in the park. Dika Deitschold refused to hand over her shield and stood on top of it. A police officer pushed her off the shield and she fell to the ground. At the same time, Grace Deitschold swung their shield at the officer and hit him, hit him in the head. Grace was arrested and taken to the ground in the process. Dika and Grace filed their lawsuit alleging First and Fourth Amendment violations as well as state law claims. During the pendency of the case, Dika passed away for unrelated reasons. Given the risk of an adverse jury verdict, the parties attended a judicial settlement conference and reached a mutually agreeable settlement. Under the settlement, the city will pay $25,000 to resolve this lawsuit. The city attorney's office and risk management recommend that the city council approve the settlement. I'm happy to answer any questions council has. Otherwise, this concludes my remarks. Any questions? I have a question. Commissioner Gonzalez. Just to clarify, so there was an alleged assault of a police officer in this incident? Yes. And is that the plaintiff in this case? Or was I want to be clear on who we're paying under the terms of this settlement? Yes, there was, I suppose, um, complicated situation in which um, a foam shield was swung at the officer. So while that would be aggressive behavior, I wouldn't say that it was very injury producing behavior. Did it, did it make contact with the police officer? Yes. Well, what's a foam shield? Oh, I'm sorry, foam. Foam, foam. shield. Okay, foam. got it. Still trying to visualize what that is, but um, okay. I, I have a de degree of discomfort <laughs> on the settlement, candidly, uh, in, in light of those facts, but um, I don't typically comment on settlements, but I uh, um, just bearing a, a level of discomfort uh, that we're paying out in this situation. Uh, understand these are complex settlement decisions, but I'll leave it at that. Are there any other questions? No, I, I mean, I, I'll, I'll, I'll share your discomfort, Commissioner, and I, I realize what legal counsel is doing here. Legal counsel is trying to limit our liability potential. And once something goes before a jury, we don't know what it will be. And so they're managing risk, if you will, um, in that regard. And it's unfortunate that as a government enterprise, we are not a sympathetic defendant. And that's one of the realities that we have to work with as we weigh these issues. Public testimony. It looks like Mark has something to say. 
Yes. Mark Porras. Welcome, Mark. Thanks. Uh, good morning, Mayor and Commissioners. My name is Mark Porras. Use he, him pronouns, and I'm with uh, Portland Cop Watch. So we understand the parties have come to an agreement. We have no objection to the city paying the $25,000 to settle the bodily injury lawsuit due to the harmful actions of Sergeant Brent Maxey and other unknown Portland police officers. We appear before you today on this police brutality settlement with the hope you'll discuss both the policy decisions that lead to these sorts of decisions and the lessons the city has learned in order to come closer to providing constitutional policing for Portlanders. This settlement raises the total just for 2020 protest settlements to over $2.55 million. According to court records, the plaintiff in the case and her mother were both nonviolent medics attending a daytime protest against police violence on September 26, 2020 at Peninsula Park. While the plaintiff and her mother gathered supplies near the west entrance to Peninsula Park, they, along with several other individuals, were handed foam shields and other gear for protection from law enforcement less lethal munitions. As the group gathered supplies, multiple Portland police officers aggressively pushed protesters and confiscated their supplies, including the shields. As the plaintiff's mother was asking officers whether such confiscation was lawful, several additional officers, including PPB's Brent Maxey, approached. Sergeant Maxey came from behind the plaintiff's mother, violently grabbed her jacket and shoved her to the ground where she landed on her side, injuring her shoulder, back and neck. The plaintiff attempted to assist her mother and was ambushed by multiple PPB officers, carried into the street where several officers knelt on her back, handcuffed her and violently twisted her arms. She pleaded with the officers to stop. In response, they slammed her head to the pavement. The entire incident was video recorded by multiple protesters and members of the press. The plaintiff was then arrested and charged with disorderly conduct and aggravated assault. She was found not guilty in her criminal trial. Court records revealed that the plaintiff's mother was also originally listed as plaintiff in this case. And as you heard, she died unexpectedly in May of last year. A little over six weeks before the incident, Sergeant Maxey stated during a KGW interview that he would soon be overseeing the in-service training for PPB officers. So just as with Sergeant Elam, Sergeant Maxey is another PPB officer who's been responsible for a police brutality claim and then gone on to train other officers in the Bureau. We appreciate the Compliance Officer Community Liaison for the Settlement Agreement is now reporting summary information about police misconduct settlements and jury awards. However, the draft Q3 report included data about the amounts paid out with analysis of just the average cost per incident. This completely ignores the intention behind reporting on the money paid out by the city for unconstitutional policing, which is to change police officer behavior and put safeguards in place to keep these things from happening over and over again. In the spirit of learning from our failures, we would appreciate counsel asking the city's attorney whether Sergeant Maxey was informed that this case has been settled for $25,000, whether or not he received any discipline for his actions that led to the settlement, and whether any trainings or policies have been informed by this settlement. We also hope you'll join us in encouraging the COCL and the independent monitor who will be appointed to use these incidents to actually improve policing in the future and avoid future liability. Thanks. Thank you. Any further public testimony? That completes this. All right. Very good. This is an emergency ordinance. Call the roll. Rubio. Aye. Ryan. Aye. Gonzalez. Aye. Maps. Aye. Wheeler. Uh, I just want to remind people that uh, we didn't used to take public testimony on settlements. A settlement is between the parties. And we don't know what happens in those meetings. That happens behind closed doors. They have reached a settlement. Our legal counsel has advised us to accept that settlement. Um, sometimes during public testimony, what we hear does not comport with either the facts of what we know or, frankly, what was discussed in the settlement agreement. I just want to make that disclaimer that there are things that are being said during public testimony that are completely separate from this settlement, and they may not be factually accurate. So with that disclaimer, I vote aye. The settlement is approved. The ordinance is adopted. Thanks for your good work. Thank Appreciate you. it. Next item, 192, a second reading. Amend floating structures code to clarify permitting requirements for repairs to existing flotation systems. This is a second reading of a non-emergency ordinance. Is there any further discussion on this item? Seeing none, please call the roll. Rubio. I want to thank Dave Tabot for his presentation on this ordinance and the engagement that has been done with the River Community Advisory Committee to bring their recommendations forward to council. I'm happy to support this work and vote aye. Brian. Aye. Gonzalez. Aye. Caps. Aye. Wheeler. Aye. The ordinance is adopted. And before we get to our uh, proclamation, we have just one more item, the four-fifths agenda item 192-1. 
Ensure grant funding is available through the Small Business Stabilization Restore Program for small businesses and nonprofit organizations impacted by the January 2024 winter storm. Colleagues, early in the pandemic, we launched a series of grant, loan, and technical assistance programs to support small business owners as they work to keep their doors open and stabilize their businesses during COVID. Those early efforts set the framework for subsequent city programs that are in place today and provide much needed ongoing support for small business owners throughout the city. The winter storm we just experienced recently in January added additional stress and loss to local businesses. I declared a local emergency effective January 12th, 2024 due to the winter weather impacts to the Portland metro area. Declaring this emergency with the assistance of the Portland Bureau of Emergency Management, the state, and the Small Business Administration set our response in motion and enabled us to coordinate our resources and make the full spectrum of services available to our small businesses, including grants, SBA loans, as well as technical assistance. I want to thank Commissioners Rubio and Gonzalez for their leadership along with Prosper Portland and the Portland Bureau of Emergency Management. I'm very proud of what we've been able to accomplish in response to these emergency situations. I'd like to now pass this over to Commissioner Rubio to talk us through this resolution. Commissioner. Thank you, Mayor. This January's winter storm was felt by many in our community and was particularly harsh on its impact in our small, on our small businesses, as the mayor's mentioned. The Small Business Stabilization Restore Grant Program has been supporting small businesses experiencing hardships throughout the pandemic. And I'm happy that we can expand that support by making funding available to pay for some of the most co common costs that businesses need to cover from the winter storm, including lost revenue from being closed, interior and exterior repairs, inventory loss costs, and equipment replacement. These dollars are clearly needed, but I'm pleased we're able to allocate this additional funding. But I do want to acknowledge that even with these additional resources, we will likely be able to only serve about 10 to 20% of the demand and of the need. And I hope that we can continue to work together to find other sources of funds to meet our current and future needs. As the impact of climate change continues to bear down on our community, it's incumbent upon all of us to come together in partnership before, during, and after weather emergencies and other natural events. And through creative partnerships and collaborations, we'll be able to take decision, action, uh, decisive action to support our communities and local businesses and swiftly respond with meaningful support. So I want to thank our partners at the Independent Restaurant Association for their call to action and the collaborative approach that we've been able to take to get to this moment. Helping small businesses recover and thrive is our top priority. So I'll now hand it over to Commissioner Gonzalez. Thank you, Commissioner Rubio. This effort is a great example of what is possible when our bureaus collaborate efficiently, deliver resources within our community. I want to thank the Bureau of Emergency Management for collaborating with Prosper Portland with this work and for identifying additional funding for this grant. I appreciate our partnership with the state for declaring this winter storm an emergency, which allows us to mobilize resources, including the Small Business Administration. I also want to thank our federal partners at the SBA and Prosper Portland for utilizing existing programs to get funds into the hands of our small business owners as quickly as possible. Our resources do come with their own restrictions, and I'm glad that we can partner with Prosper Portland and ensure the greatest flexibility in delivering aid to our community. With that, I will pass it to Rushit Nerwal from PBEM and Amy Nagy from Prosper Portland. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Richard Narwal. I'm Planning and Preparedness Manager, Portland Bureau of Emergency Management. Would you uh, please move to the next slide? Okay. Uh, and as I said, thank you, Commissioner Gonzalez and Commissioner Rubio for giving us time on the council agenda today to discuss the need for continuing council support for recovery efforts from the damage caused by the January 2024 uh, winter storm. PBAM has been coordinating citywide recovery efforts as several city bureaus are engaged in four key recovery areas that you can see on, see on the slide deck. Uh, as you can see, B, uh, damage for damage assessment, BDS has been leading that work for the city. The work has been completed. Parks and PBOT has been coordinating for debris management and clearing the debris from right away. 
with parks, Portland Parks still working on processing and collecting, collecting debris from their property. The city is also currently coordinating with the state on FEMA public assistance process, and uh, we'll be sharing more information on that with bureaus in uh, coming in next few weeks. The main reason why we are today is to discuss small business uh, efforts that our uh, city has undertaken for small business economic recovery from the storm. Several businesses reported direct or indirect losses to their operations during the uh, January winter storm. Over 600 businesses self-reported damage in a survey conducted by Oregon Department for Emergency Management. And in response, Small, small Business Administration declared an emergency to support these businesses. Why we are here today? We are here today to request council support to increase funding for Small Business Restore Grant in response to winter storm impacts by reclaiming ARPA, which is uh, American Rescue Plan Act allocation and al allocating an equivalent amount of unrestricted general funds to prosper Portland during the spring bomb crisis. To talk about why we need to do this and how this funding will be used, I'll pass it to, uh, I'll pass the mic to Amy. Great, thank you so much. Uh, good morning, everybody, Commissioners, Mayor. My name is Amy Nagy. I'm the Development Manager at Prosper Portland, and my team oversees the administration of the Restore Grant. This grant is something that has been in existence in one form or another for, for quite a long time as the, as the pandemic has pursued or persisted. Um, we offer financial support to assist small businesses to help them remain open and operational while also maintaining a healthy street environment. Under the current program, there are grants are up to $25,000, and those are for costs associated with security and prevention, insurance premium increases, deferred rents, interior repairs, and inventory loss that have been due to break-ins. In hearing from our small business community about the impacts of the winter storm and what it's had on them, we've expanded the eligibility for this award cycle to cover some of the most common costs that these businesses are incurring and need to manage right now. Those costs include the revenue loss for that week of the storm, both interior and exterior repairs from the storm damage, as well as equipment replacement that may have also resulted from the storm. Business owners also may receive up to $25,000. Next slide, please. This grant is for both small businesses and nonprofits that are operating a brick and mortar location that have a ground floor customer facing storefront. Food trucks that are operating in the city may also apply. To be eligible for this particular winter storm funding, they must have been impacted by the winter storm of, in January of this year, employ three people or more, including contractors, and have had a gross revenue up to $3 million in 2019 or 2022. Next slide, please. The application window for this is still open, and to date we have received more than 900 applications specifically seeking winter storm assistance. A cursory look at these applications show that over half of these are from restaurant owners. We will use a prioritization criteria that includes number of employees supported, as well as a scale of revenue impacted based on the gross revenue losses during the week of the storm. We anticipate most of these applicants will be seeking grants to cover their revenue loss, which on average will likely be about $8,000 and will bring our estimated need to over $7 million. This is this actually has the potential to exhaust all of the restore grant resources that are intended to take us through the end of this calendar year in just responding to the winter storm. Currently, we have $500,000 in general fund resources that we're making available now. However, given this demand, we are here to request that Council help us to increase that amount of funding to support more small businesses by reclaiming the ARPA allocation that currently funds our Restore program and allocating it the equivalent in the general fund. Next slide, please. So with that, the action needed for today, there's a resolution that you have that states the council will and its intent to support our programming. It will allow Prosper to continue to receive our applications and evaluate them. And then during the spring uh, bump process, we'll have, once all those applications are, are completed in review, we'll have a better idea of the total amount that we'll need to put forward in an ordinance and then do the necessary updates in the IGAs in order to make the transaction possible. Thank you. Very good. Thanks. Any questions at this point? 
Yeah. Do you your maps? If I do. Um, Amy, can you – I don't understand the money flow here. Can, you, can we do that again? Um, where is the money coming from? Are we? At, it seems like we're adding – we're taking ARPA dollars that were allocated for something and then moving it around. And frankly, I'm having a, a – I'm not tracking all of it. Can you repeat for me how this is going to work? Yeah, that's no problem. You're right that the current the current funding source for Restore is ARPA. Um, there is uh, ARPA is not at this moment viewed to be uh, an eligible use to cover winter storm events, okay. and so we want to make sure that we can serve the small businesses. And to do that, we would need general fund dollars. So under what would be allowed, kind of in the reclaiming of the ARPA allocation, um, that that is an allowable use for to actually use for. Other deficits within the city and then put forward the general fund in order for us to issue the grants, administer the grants. Mr. Mayor, where in the, I guess I'm, I'm trying struggling with the general fund piece. When and where does that come into play? And I didn't receive a briefing on this. All of this happened kind of fast. So I'm, I, I am uh, authentically catching up. Uh, there's probably some conversations that should have happened earlier this week or last week that didn't. Um, so are you seeking a future allocation from the general fund? I can speak to that a little bit, sure. uh, Mr. Mapp. So the general fund will be made allocated during the spring bump process. What, this, what we are asking today is just the the, count, the, the council is uh, in support of that strategy. It's there's no net change to the city general fund. This we, the, there's there will be no net uh, impact to the city budget. We're just the reason why we need to do it this way is to kind of expand the eligibility of businesses that can apply to receive this grant. So we're just taking that fund back and then reallocating with then expand uh with an expanded use okay so you'll come back with yeah we 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 may need to come back after the spring bunk process or during the spring bunk process for for one or uh for if there's an approval needed at that stage what if there's no new money in the spring bump I, 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 this there is no there's no it's it's a money that already is there we're just taking it back and re, re releasing it uh to prosper there's there's no net change to the to the overall cost or or the budget of the even prosper portland okay um and one thank i appreciate the clarification and one more question so there's kind of two tracks here. One, uh, restore dollars, I believe it's called, to help businesses that are hurt by vandalism and whatnot, and one for a storm. Are we reducing the, the amount of dollars that are available for people who suffer vandalism in order to do the storm thing, or do they both kind of continue um, at current levels? It's a great question. They're both eligible under this cycle. So folks that are experiencing kind of and wanting to cover costs under what has been the standard program um, are eligible to apply it and have been applying and will be considered for an award. And then this was the one opportunity that we could do to respond quickly to the business's call for support. And so we're trying to tap into this existing program and expand the kind of eligibility costs to cover to support them as well. Okay. Thank you very much. Commissioner sure. Ryan. Yeah, thank you, Mayor, and uh, thank you both Commissioner Rubio and Commissioner Gonzalez for bringing this to our attention. Um, I, we receive a lot of emails, we all do, about the challenges of working this system, and um, so I just want to hear what type of um, updates you've done to your staffing model, to your customer service, um, when, when there'll be even a bigger increase to respond to the people who are reaching out to Prosper for this. <laughs> Commissioner, I'm sorry, are you, are you directing that to me? Uh, yes, it would be, Amy, you're with Prosper Portland. I am, And yes. you're the, the entity that manages the, the grants? Right, 
Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. So we, we have a team um, already in place that responds and works with small businesses on their applications. Um, luckily, we've, we've been providing some of these, some form of these grants since the pandemic began and have been able to build out our infrastructure as well as our kind of human resources to respond. So we continue to kind of automate on the application process and then have people available to talk with businesses directly. Unfortunately, as, as Commissioner Rubio highlighted, though, there will be, we won't be able to serve everybody with the existing resources that we have in light of the demand. Um, and so part of this is an opportunity to increase the, the impact that we're having and serve some, and then also a call for, for I think, greater support and potential future dollars um, in order to continue to work with our small businesses and get them their resources. Great, any further questions? Any public testimony? No one signed up. Please call the roll. Rubio. I want to thank both Rachid and PBEM and Amy and Prosper for their great work on this and also Commissioner Gonzalez for his partnership on this project. And as the team explained, the need far surpasses the available funds uh, to meet that need. And now that we have the data and, and the documented need, um, we'll be working with this team to continue looking for additional avenues of redress that, to meet that need. Um, it's also clear that uh, the city can't do it alone, and I'm directing Prosper staff to work with PBEM and reaching out to our partners at the state and county level to identify additional sources of support. Um, so with that, I will turn it over to my colleague for closing comments. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. We were in the middle of the vote. Yes. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. Um, I strongly support this strategy and I would like to say thanks again. I vote aye. Ryan. Yes, um, I think we all know that government services uh, must persist well after the storm ends, and the storm isn't over for us until we, until we finish that job. I know we're experiencing that a lot with uh, trees and parks and with our small businesses who were um, having a lot of economic deprivation um, added on because of the storm. So I'm grateful that you two came together and uh, put this together. I do hope that we can improve our customer service um, for Prosper to respond to that need. I vote aye. Gonzalez. Uh, I want to thank Commissioner Rubio as well as for your dexterity there. I think our order got <laughs> disrupted a little bit, but uh, I'd just like to echo what you stated. We need to continue this absolutely vital program for so many of our local businesses. Loans are not a viable option. Grant programs like these are what is needed to aid businesses around our city, county, and state. I'm directing PBEM uh, to continue working with Prosper staff and reaching out to county and state partners to see if they have additional funds to make sure we are doing everything we can to continue this crucial investment in our region and our small businesses. Thank you, PBEM, and thank you, Prosper Portland, for your exceptional work on this project. I'm happy to vote aye on this resolution and look, uh, and look forward to looking at how the county and state can assist this program in expanding. Thank you. Maps. Um, I want to thank uh, Commissioner Gonzalez and Commissioner Rubio for bringing this item forward. Um, I, I got to speak to my staff and maybe other staff. I wasn't aware this was going to be on the agenda today. Um, and so some communication has uh, fallen down. I wish I had had more time to unpack what was happening here. I appreciate the understanding that we got um, from Amy, um, and I trust my colleagues. I'm certainly aware of the challenges posed by that storm. Um, that is particularly true as an infrastructure person. So I'm going to vote I. Um, I may want to circle back uh, with my colleagues to learn more about how, uh, especially the color of money on this one, uh, works. Thank you. Wheeler. I want to thank Commissioner Rubio and Commissioner Gonzalez for bringing this forward. I appreciate it. Uh, many of us have had the opportunity to meet with our regional SBA administrator in the last week or so. Uh, I had the opportunity to meet with him yesterday. What I learned was that this is not a problem unique to Portland, that small businesses all around the country are continuing to struggle well beyond uh, the time period where we thought the economy would return to some semblance of normalcy. It is certainly acute here. Uh, I had an opportunity last week to meet with some of our most successful restaurateurs who told me that the situation that they're experiencing is dire. Even some of the restaurants that are packed every single day due to economic forces, inflation, lease costs, and the like. And so this sort of 
support continues to be necessary if we believe that small businesses are critical to the future success of this city. And being reminded that 80% of the people in this city are employed by small businesses underscores the critical nature of this resolution. I am very appreciative again to my colleagues for bringing it forward. I support it. I vote aye and the resolution is adopted. All right, without further ado, thank you for everyone here who has been so patient regarding item 187, a very important proclamation. Proclaim February 2024 to be art and black history. Keelan, there's been a request. Can we take a three minute break? Oh. There's, uh, I, I'm sorry, and that, that goes for everyone in the audience. Um, we'll take a three minute break. We're in recess for three minutes. <laughs>
search there. There it is. Um, item 187, please, a proclamation. Proclaim February 2024 to be Art and Black History Month. Colleagues, good morning. Again, this month we have the honor of recognizing Black History Month in the city of Portland. Black History Month gives us an opportunity to recognize and uplift the very significant and important contributions of black Americans and all that they have done through our society throughout the history of this country. This month gives us time to recognize the black leaders who led social movements, often risking their lives in the name of justice and equality. It's also time to reflect on the countless barriers faced by black Americans, especially in Portland and in Oregon, where discriminatory policies stood for decades. We must use this unjust history to strengthen our collective understanding and to create a better future for us all. I also want to thank and welcome those of you from our community who've joined us today to recognize this important proclamation. With that, I'll turn this over to Commissioner Maps. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. Colleagues, I'm delighted to join you in proclaiming February to be Black History Month here in Portland, Oregon. We have a packed agenda this morning, so I'll keep my initial comments brief. Uh, my job right now is to provide everyone with a quick run of show for this morning's presentation. Um, after my overview of today's uh, run of show, I'll hand the floor over to Commissioner Ryan, who will provide more context on today's proclamation. I believe Commissioner Ryan will then uh, conclude by handing the mic off to uh, Courtney Capri, who will lead us in song. And then we will hear from a distinguished panel of community members who will address council on themes related to Black History Month. And after those presentations, members of council will have an opportunity to share their comments on today's presentation. And then I will read most of the proclamation. Uh, but of course, the mayor will We'll read the final paragraph, which is traditional, and then I hope that council can take a brief recess so we can take a photograph with our guests. Uh, and with that, uh, Commissioner Ryan, I will hand the floor over to you. Okay, thank you, Commissioner Maps, and how wonderful to have so many people in the audience that I just happen to know, and I'm excited to hear your voices and actually not mine. And, you know, I want to mix this up a little bit. I think um, we need to be grounded in song. So um, could we start with... Uh, Courtney coming up and leading us in song. All right. And I think some of us even have the words, although turn your microphone, I'll turn my microphone off, but. You don't want to hear me sing. I don't want to hear you sing. Actually, I do want to hear you sing. Oh, it's not fun. I voted for you. Oh, thank you so much. I appreciate your accountability. Uh, so I heard that there was a lack of time, so I'm just going to do the first verse. I'm glad we have this sheet here. I encourage you to take this home and read these words. It's very, very, very important. So here we go. It was Stephen Sarah. <laughs> Lift every voice and sing till earth and heaven ring. Ring with the harmonies of liberty. Let our rejoicing rise high as the skies. Let it resound. Loud as the rolling sea. Let us get 
It's so wonderful that we're going to concentrate on art today, and it will be great to have the guests come up and tell their stories. Take it away, Darian. Yeah, thank you, uh, Commissioners, Council. Uh, my name is Darian Jones. I'm the Senior Policy Director of Arts, Culture, and Equity for the city. And today I'm excited to welcome some of our distinguished guests here to speak a little bit about their experience as black artists and black Oregonians in support of the proclamation this month. So first, I'll have Intasar Arbioto coming up to the dais. Uh, Intasar is a Portland-based artist and curator of the Black Artists of Oregon exhibit. Welcome. Um, this is so special. Um, thank you to everyone here. And I always want to... Um, Acknowledge everybody in the room and also, you know, when we're thinking about African and, and black, African and diasporic practices, we're also thinking about the people before us, the ancestors who have been here, who are still here with us, behind us, alongside us. Um, and I think for me, black art, you know, I'm coming from a black arts family based in Tennessee, based in Memphis. My mom, um, um, my mom, Midnight, Abioto is is my consummate muse. Um, my Baba Ekpe Abioto, who's an arts educator, you know, and we're coming from from a family of Black artists, Black educators, Black activists, and and Black practices of life and liberation are everywhere. And so being here in Portland, um, we, it can't help but be about art. It can't help but be about liberation. It can't help but be about community. So I'm so excited uh, to be able to be a part of celebrating in community with and alongside community black arts practices of caretaking for a black life. And so, you know, with Black Artists of Oregon, um, Black people have, wherever black people are, we are artists. We are artful, we're artful in our living, and we're artful in our craft. And I just, I don't have a lot of words to say. I know there's a whole exhibit that people can go look at. And after the exhibit, to know that this is not, well, Black Artists of Oregon at the Portland Art Museum, and that's coming from black arts elders and black youth. And I just want people to go see it, but to understand that that is not the end. When this show closes, that it's a beginning, and we will respect black artists. We will respect arts workers. We will respect arts community, their influence, their, their education, their dedication, and that we will be represented in every place that's about us. So I, this is for us. This is for us. This is for us. Awesome. Thank you, Antisar. That was really beautiful. And next, I'll have Rupert Kennard come up, who is a Portland-based artist, and work is also in the exhibit that's going on right now. Welcome. Good morning. Uh, I'm very honored to be here. And one of the main things I, I would want to convey is that I so appreciate the city of Portland acknowledging the work that um, Isitar has done, Isitar has done with this exhibit at the uh, Oregon Art Museum. Um, I just really want to be really clear and share something that I've said to Intasar a number of times, which has to do with my being included as a part of the exhibit as a cartoonist. And what that speaks to for me is that she was really, really dedicated to making sure that that exhibit covered every form of art. And one of the other things I, I was able to, um, she was also responsible for, was my designing the children's activity guide for the uh, exhibit. And I mentioned that because, 
because every time I've gone to the museum I'm not, and I've seen young people interact with that exhibit, it has so lifted my heart. And so just any acknowledgement of the work that she's done on that exhibit. Um, at one point, she invited me to be a part of the show, and she came by my home, and we, cho we chose some um, images uh, for the, the exhibit. And I kind of lost track of what was going on. And the day that the exhibit opened and I went into the art museum, I was blown away by the sheer scope of what she was able to pull together. And so... In, 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 in the work that, that she's done, I'm, I'm just absolutely grateful for it. So... Um, thank you. Thank you for allowing me to be here and say a few words. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next, we'll have Grace Cook Anderson come up, who's here in place of John Goodwin, uh, as she's the curator of the Northwest Art uh, at the Portland Art Museum. Grace? Hit me instead. <laughs> All right. Now, there's been a few shifting schedules today. Grace is home with a cold. So I am uh, filling in for the Portland Art Museum. I'm Stephanie Parrish. I am the Director of Learning and Community Partnerships. And it is a just pure joy to be here today to honor Intisar Abioto. Intisar, I think we worked together about a decade ago. Um, I invited Intisar to do an artist talk at the museum. And it opened up this amazing portal to what you um, are seeing today, the Black Artists of Oregon exhibition. And it's just been an incredible honor to work with you in every way, shape, and form. I don't want to cry here, um, but your passion, your um, intentionality, everything you bring to all of your work, to the people you bring around you, and just the joy, the pure joy. So I encourage each and every one of you on this council to walk through those doors at the Portland Art Museum. We are free next Thursday, all day, from 10 to 8 p.m. Last month, I think we had 4,000 people come to the museum, all shapes and sizes and walks of life. And Intisar will probably be there to greet you. I'll be there to greet you, and you'll have a great time. Um, so please, please tell everyone, come one, come all, and let's just celebrate this amazing exhibition and this amazing curator. Awesome. Thanks, Intisar. Thank you. We have two more invited guests today. Uh, the next is Alex Jareb, who's from the Seoul District. He's here on behalf of the director, John Washington. Thank you, Alex. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Alex Gubrab. I'm the uh, business navigator for the uh, Seoul District Business Association, a nearly 50-year organization um, that is uh, in the uh, North Northeast Business uh, uh, District. Uh, today, I'm here on behalf of uh, John Washington, who couldn't make it as he is attending a ceremony for uh, the Kafuri uh, housing uh, uh, project that they're partnering up with uh, PCRI. Uh, so on behalf of uh, John Washington, ladies and gentlemen, uh, distinguished guests and fellow advocates for Black History Month, I stand before you today as John Washington, the executive director of the Seoul District Business Association and the CEO of Flossom Media. It is an honor to be here speaking at this momentous event led by Commissioner Mingus Maps. Black History Month is a time for us to reflect on the remarkable contributions and achievements of black individuals throughout history. It is a time to celebrate our resilience our strength, and our unwavering commitment to progress. Today, I want to share with you a message that is unapologetically black and it is in its tone, but also serves as an inspiration, a motivation, and an, ed an educational reminder for us all. For several years now, uh, Flossin Magazine, I have made it a priority to commission black artists to create our magazine covers. Why? because I believe in power of representation. I believe that when we showcase the talents and creativity of black artists, we not only uplift their voices, but also inspire generations to come. We, reclaim, we are reclaiming our narrative, one cover at a time. In my role as the executive director of the Seoul District Business Association, I have wit witnessed firsthand the transformative impact of artistic expression and community engagement on our district's identity and the small businesses within it. 
Through various art installations and events, we have created a vibrant and inviting atmosphere that attracts visitors and supports uh, local businesses. Imagine strolling through the streets of Seoul District, surrounded by vibrant murals that tell the stories of our heritage and showcase our collective journey. These murals serve as a visual representation of our community's strength and resilience. They become, uh, they become landmarks that draw people from all, of, all walks of life to explore and experience dis the distinct character of our district. As, as visitors immerse themselves in the spirit of the Seoul District, they are naturally drawn to the local businesses that embody the essence of our culture. From restaurants offering authentic flavors of our cuisine to boutiques showcasing the craftsmanship of local artisans. Our small businesses thrive with the increased foot traffic and exposure generated by the artistic energy of the district. Moreover, the art and cultural expressions within our district foster a sense of pride and ownership amongst residents. When we see our stories represented through various art forms, it instills a deep sense of belonging and connection. The pride translates to uh, unwavering support for small businesses within the district. As residents become ambassadors, spreading the word about the unique experiences that await in our community. I want to take a moment to highlight two pieces, showcased in the Seoul District in particular, that have resonated deeply with, with me. Still I Rise by renowned artist uh, R.V. Smith and Still Here by Sharita Town. These, pow these powerful works of art in, uh, encapsulates the struggles and triumphs of our ancestors and serves as a reminder of the strength and resilience that runs through our veins. They are a testament to the indomitable spirit of the black community and a call to action for us to continue the fight for justice and equality. In closing, I want to express my gratitude to Commissioner Mingus Maps for providing us with this platform to amplify our voices and share our stories. Commissioner Dan Ryan, Dan Ryan for prioritizing peacemaking as part of the economic narrative. Let us seize this moment to come together, uplift one another, and forge a brighter future for us all. Together, we can harness the power of artistic expression and community engagement to shape the identity of the Seoul District and empower our small businesses to thrive. Thank you, and may we continue to march forward with pride, purpose, and unwavering determination, that knowing that our collective efforts will bring positive change to our beloved city of Portland. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. We're reading that, Alex, on behalf of John Washington. And our final guest is uh, online today. I see Maurice is here. Uh, Maurice Roming is the owner and founder of O'Neill Construction. Uh, welcome, Maurice. Welcome up. Thank you. Thank you for having me, uh, Mayor Commissioners. Uh, my name is Maurice Roming. I'm the owner of O'Neill Construction Group, Howard Jacobs Masonry, and O'Neill Electric. One of the things that I want to say is that, you know, there is a lot of people that came before me, but I did want to share my story to give just grounding on the work that you all do. Um, many of you know that I am from single mom from a, a, let's just say we, I know what food stamps look like. I know what poverty looks like. And construction was a pathway out of poverty for myself. Um, and so by being able to get into a pre-apprenticeship program and they get into an apprenticeship program, become a journeyman, and then become a contractor, that was my pathway. Um, currently, O'Neill Construction Group has been in business for over 25 years. It's a company that me and my wife founded. We have over 150 employees um, between electricians, carpenters, masons, laborers, an extremely diverse team. Um, and you know, we're, we're a proud union owned company as well. So we are signatory with a lot. We work with them to increase diversity in the industry. Um, and so what we do today matters. I know that the city adopted community benefits agreements, uh, regional workforce agreements that actually help with Metro to look at regional approaches to have more inclusion of black owned businesses black workers on the job site and making sure that we're paid a fair wage for that work. Um, so it's not just about the contractors, it's about the workers, right? Because we need to create these pathways. We need to create these new opportunities for people. Um, I look at um, basically the wastewater treatment plant that we worked on, Bull Run, all these opportunities create a more vibrant city. This is the work that you all done Right? There's still a lot of work to be done, you know, whether it's bonding, whether it's value 
as resellers, there's barriers that we collectively need to work together to work through, right? But I wanna just thank you all for actually doing this. What you're doing is you're creating more opportunities for black people to be able to participate, black businesses to be able to participate on city work. 25 years ago, it was just a goal, a percentage, and no one disaggregated anything. Today, you guys are doing that work. I am very humbled and very proud of the work that you all are doing and continue to do. And I just thank you for this opportunity to speak today as a business owner, as a black owned business owner. I don't just speak for my company. There are a number of companies, whether Pacific Mark Pays, and I could go on that are black owned businesses or that are Northwest infrastructure that are succeeding and excelling because of the work that you guys, the legislation, the rules that you guys are passing in order to make sure that we have the opportunity to participate. Thank you for that. Um, and I'll, I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. That concludes uh, invited testimony. Very good. Council comments before the proclamation. Commissioner Gonzalez. I just want to I want to thank uh, you for the opportunity to join in the celebration of Black History Month and the arts of black artists around the state of Oregon. This is truly necessary, not just for the education, but for the understanding and acknowledgement of the hard but important work that black artists have done and continue to do here in Oregon. This month and year, let's continue to celebrate art and Black History Month, not just in words, but with our actions by supporting local black artists and businesses. Art that has contributed to making the state vibrant in spite of historic exclusionary laws and discrimination towards its longtime residents. Making sure our black artists are being supported with resources to help them expand their reach, not just in the state, but nationally and internationally. For all the hard work ahead of us, that's required to restore Portland's safety and livability. We need to engage with black voices in neighborhoods, churches, and businesses, and to be responsive to their concerns as a city. And then let's do it again in March, April, and May, uh, every month, because this can't be just a one-time deal, but a permanent part of who we are as a city and people. We celebrate the contribution of African-Americans who transform to this very day, this nation, despite what they have endured. I would like to thank all the artists, artists and creatives that turned out and made this presentation not just possible, but inspiring. I know I'm looking forward to attending the Portland Art Museum's Black History Artist of Oregon exhibit before it ends. Thank you all for being here tonight. Hey, it's not quite tonight. Commissioner Rubio. Um, thank you, Mayor Wheeler and Commissioners Maps and Ryan for bringing this important proclamation forward. And um, Intizari, I just love your energy and your heart. And I'm just going to quote you back to you uh, right now because you, I read something that you that you wrote and I wanted to reference here um, because it's so strong. Um, as attacks on truthful tellings of black history take place nationally, we know black art history it. Black art history is black history. Black art history is not only a tool of education, but a tool to affirm and support black life and living today. And that's very, very powerful for me to read and to hear uh, because as we all know, and everybody, um, we say it all the time, but this month, it shouldn't just be about this month, it should be every month. Uh, we need to acknowledge that that long-standing story and those impacts and racist policies and systems, how they've had, how they're bearing out into what what is happening today, um, and it also speaks to the history and the voice and the stories that have been attempted to be erased from our collective history, but have not been successful in being erased. And we also see the black joy and liberation and strength as well, as you, you referenced. Um, and so in, in the exhibits, um, if, if people have not gone, I would strongly encourage you to go. And I truly believe that if you love this city, if you love Portland, you care about our collective future, it's important to go. 
because it is the nourishment and the truth that our hearts and souls need right now. And as art, as an art, we need to be recognizing black contributions in economic development and advocacy, nonprofits, education and leadership and the history of our elected leadership in this city, despite these barriers and these challenges. Um, it's essential for us as a, as a healthy community to recognize, um, recognize these things because when black families thrives and black community thrives, Portland thrives. So I just wanted to thank Courtney for singing the song, leading us in song, and thanks to each of you who have, have commented and who show up. Despite the challenges of living in this city and thriving in the city, you are here today, and that honors us, and that honors our city. So uh, more than ever, we need um, these illuminating moments and stories. Um, so thank you for shining so brightly. Well, I want to thank our guests, uh, and Jassar, thank you so much um, for being here. Rupert, it's good to see you. Um, I can't remember who was here from uh, Portland Art Museum. That's you. You're not Grace, though. Stephanie. 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 All right. Thank you for being here. I love the connection between the two of you up here. And Alex and Maurice Rami. I want to also thank Courtney Capri. One of my better moments was to not lead this, but to have you come up and, and set the right tone for this uh, very special item. Thank you so much, Courtney. I also want to recognize the city staff, particularly you, Darian Jones, for making sure that we really stewarded this process and that we really included the right voices today. And uh, it was definitely a powerful storytelling. And these are moments that we need and desire at the dais at city council meetings. Uh, last year, I was fortunate to go to the Black Artist um, of Oregon exhibit a few times. One was when a lot of people were there. Quite frankly, I didn't see as much as I'd like. I went back by myself and uh, with two other people, and it was really moving, and so moved that uh, we turned it into our holiday party, right? Yeah, so our staff had our beginning of our holiday party there, and it was profound. It put us in a really different place. And when you're doing public service work, I'll speak for myself. I think some could share this. We, It's a very noisy, aggressive, very petty um, sector at times. Um, a lot of misinformation, not enough direct, authentic communication, and so, our skin has to become hard to survive, but it's so important that we take time to keep our hearts soft so that we can compassionately lead. And art does that for me. And that exhibit in particular came at such the right time. So thank you so much for the healing um, and the inspiration that that exhibit provides. <clears throat> I went way off script, where am I? Um, so basically, from arts and culture to science and technology to activism, leadership, black Americans have made a lasting impact on society with so many deep, deep obstacles. And like Maurice Rami mentioned, um, he's building generational wealth. He's coming from that single mom to building a company and thriving. And that is such a great story. So it was wonderful to end with Maurice telling his story. I always go to um, my go-to author is James Baldwin. Um, he once said, all art is a kind of a confession, more or less oblique. All artists, if they are to survive, are forced at, at last to tell the whole story, to vomit the anguish up. Black history, which goes beyond February, is an opportunity to celebrate the stories of black Americans. Please go read a book, go to a play, watch a movie, and go see the brilliant exhibit that's currently at the Art Museum and build that perspective. I'm humbled to support this proclamation. Thanks. Thank you. With that, I'll turn it over to Commissioner Maps to read almost all of the proclamation. Yeah, uh, uh, thank you very much. And uh, before I read the proclamation, I do want to, uh, number one, thank our guests for uh, um, um, offering their thoughts and song today. I want to thank everyone for being um, uh, in the crowd and online for watching us. I want to thank my colleagues for their comments. Um, and I frankly, I, w I was going to avoid giving um, a speech here because I know you all have been patient. But I do, since we're friends, I did want to kind of share a little bit of a journey I've been on as we've been preparing for um, today's presentation. Uh, those who know me know that I am historically minded, uh, and that very much motivates who I am and why I do what I do. Um, and as I have been thinking about today's proclamation, uh, one of the things, one of the questions that has been rolling around my head was, um, 
where my great grandmother's parents slaves. Uh, those of you who know me uh, am, or have been watching council um, proceedings for a couple of years have probably heard me talk about my great grandmother. She lived to a ripe old age, uh, well more than 100 years old, so I got to know her a little bit as a young man. Uh, I've talked to her. I've talked about her in this room, <laughs> Big Mama. Uh, and when you hear me talk about M Big Mama, I usually tell a story about how I would go and visit her in Texas. And uh, some of my most vivid memories about Big Mama was that she had guns everywhere. Uh, <laughs> she had guns. I'm not joking. She had guns in her cookie jar. She had guns <laughs> under the bed. She had guns in the closet. Um, and the reason why she had guns, uh, because she lived at a time and in a place where the Klan might show up and would show up. Um, and I, so in order to, and I kind of remember, and frankly, I do remember her kind of talking about people in her life uh, who were slaves, which is kind of a remarkable human chain to think that I know someone, in fact, my, someone who's dear and close to, my, to me, someone who made me possible, uh, and I had conversations with, and went fishing with, and cooked with, um, and uh, she had a lived experience of slavery. And so uh, um, the question I kind of have been wondering and trying to remember, if I remember correctly, is were her parents slaves? And so that resulted in a MAPS family sort of text chain as we're kind of uh, hunting down that question. And the answer to the question of whether or not her parents were slaves um, basically boils down to, when do you think emancipation came to Texas? Which actually is a complex historical story and we won't get it. Or, uh, well, Texas is also quite interesting. Uh, um, uh, and actually, I'm glad you brought up uh, um, Oregon, because that's the other, when I think about that story, um, another sort of personal history story I think about is my grandfather. I think some of you have heard me talk about my grandfather in this room, too. Uh, during uh, World War II, my grandfather was in the Army, and on occasion, he would come up to Portland um, on r and &R. And in Portland, um, during that time, even when you were in a military uniform, he could not get served at restaurants, except for Chinese restaurants. Um, and then you flash forward a generation or two and you get to me, um, who has the unique distinction of being the fourth African American to serve on this council. Um, I'll let all of you uh, ponder the moral meaning of that trajectory. Um, I think it does support the words of Martin Luther King, who said that, you know, uh, I'm going to paraphrase here, but the arc of history is long, but it bends towards justice. That's been my experience, too. Um, I'm aware that we are all here for just a very short time, and the reasons why we are here has a lot to do with the people who got us here and also the people who will come after us. And so that is um, some of the things I'm thinking about uh, this afternoon as we come to celebrate this important event. And with that, I have the great honor of reading this proclamation. And it goes like this. Whereas the city of Portland stands united in commemorating Black History Month this February, joining the nation in honoring the rich legacy and contributions of the black community in Oregon. And whereas, as the city embraces the 2020-24 Black History Month theme, Black Oregonians and the Arts, and whereas the city of Portland celebrates and recognizes Oregon's black artists and black arts communities. Portland-based artist Intisar Abioto and the Portland Art Museum for their collaboration on the Black Artist of Oregon exhibition, which spans the 1880s 
to the present day and showcases Black Oregonians' artistic heritage and provides a distinctive historical and educational journey in Portland. And whereas the Black Artist of Oregon exhibit has illuminated a broad spectrum of black artistry to thousands in Portland and beyond, featuring works from 69 artists and more than 200 objects, capturing the unique experiences of the black diaspora in the Pacific Northwest, highlighting the lasting legacy and impact of black artists in Oregon and the arts. And whereas, in Tessar Abioto, both as a photographer and the curator of the historic Black Artist of Oregon exhibit at the Portland Art Museum, has significantly enriched Portland's arts community, beginning her journey with the Black Portlanders blog, which transformed into gallery installations vividly showcasing the diversity within Portland's Black community. And whereas Abioto's dedication to highlighting the beauty of Black people against the backdrop of the city's history of displacement and gentrification led to a unique collaboration with the Portland Art Museum. And whereas Black Artist of Oregon is a testament to the many individual Black artist elders who made the exhibition possible through their work over the decades, forming the foundation of the showcase and highlighting the enduring legacy and impact of Black artistry. And whereas Black artists have used art to preserve history and community memory, as well as create a shared narrative and understanding. And whereas Portland Parks and Recreation's Interstate Firehouse Cultural Center was founded in 1982, and applaud that, by Portland's first African-American elected official, Commissioner Charles Jordan, and has served as our cultural home for the black community in North and Northeast Portland. The IFCC has recently hosted a residency program for black artists and arts performances. As works continues on a feasibility study to guide the future of the center. And whereas the city of Portland acknowledges the innovative spirit of black Americans nationally, who have thrived amidst systemic adversities and whose resilience continues to shape the civil rights movements in pursuit of social justice and equity. And whereas we recognize the profound influence of the black voice unwavering in its pursuit of justice and equality, crafting a narrative of strength and empowerment and whereas the city is committed to supporting the achievements, successes, and contributions of Black Portlanders and embraces the essence of Black history. Now, therefore, I, Ted Wheeler, Mayor of the City of Portland, Oregon, the City of Roses, do hereby proclaim February 2024 to be Art and Black History Month in Portland and encourage all residents to celebrate this month. Thank you, everybody. Mr. Mayor, could we take a recess and do a photo? Are in fact adjourned. All right. And we can do a photo right out front. It's probably the best. What's up? Yeah. And then, Darian, do you want to make an announcement about this? <laughs>